Hi, my name is Susan. I'm from World Peaceful. And today is the 21st of September. It's the International Day of Peace. And it is the one day that's earmarked by the United Nations, which asks for a global ceasefire and for people to contemplate peace around the world. I think at this time in 2017, with the tensions between the United States and North Korea. This is probably a very significant International Day of Peace as people believe that they were on the precipice of destroying ourselves through mutually assured destruction given the nuclear aspect of this conflict. There's also the religious aspect coming in where people see the 23rd of September as the end of it all. And there's others, of course, who'll be saying, look, there's earthquakes, there's hurricanes, something really terrible is happening on the planet with the environment. I don't actually subscribe to the fear myself. I believe we're at the precipice of great change. And as we know in our own lives, always transformative change is preceded by great upheaval. And we are one with the ecosystem, we are one with life. Some people see that life as nature, as a living organism, which it is. Others see it as um, a god, some people will call, an intelligence in the universe. Others will see intelligent design all around us. Others have various faiths and beliefs in something that's way more powerful than what we think we are. I personally know that there is an intelligent power. I don't really like to label it because it often gives it an image and I see it more as an energy and I think and feel it as inherent within all of us. For me, it expresses through love, which is why in a lot of my work, I'm often talking about love. I believe love is the one single word that will unite humanity. If we drop all the beliefs and we drop all the force and control and simply practice to love one another, I think this is one of the most important teachings on our planet today and certainly one that's not lost on any mother and father who has children. When you look into the eyes of your own child, what is it that you feel? And can we rekindle that feeling when we look at strangers? I've been able to do it myself because I've clowned around the world. And as a clown, you look at everyone and you see nothing but beauty. And I've always believed that that is the dropping of the mask. I know it is. When I've looked into the eyes of thousands and thousands of people, I believe I've witnessed the true beauty of humanity, which definitely exists. Many people today are thinking people are not so nice and of course people aren't necessarily responding from the heart anymore. People are believing the media. They've allowed themselves to be indoctrinated with violent images and therefore they're projecting onto a world believing it's all violent. People don't trust each other because the media has told them about the various swindles that's happened. We've seen the drug trade, prostitution, rackets criminal activities and this has all been channeled through the media but if we're continuously focusing on this and believing that this is the world thought does attract and we do recreate the very things we're afraid of what i've come to come to understand is what you focus on uh, you bring about so what we think about we bring about this is called the law of attraction and it's an incredibly important teaching for humanity at this time. If you keep focusing on the negative and often in spiritual circles, people are focusing on this negative entity or energy rather than a positive, beautiful, loving, empathetic, empathic focus. In order to love one another, we have to look through the misunderstandings, the dysfunctions. 
the poor modelling of people, which are really masks. From the perspective of a clown, they're all masks that we use to hide the tenderness within ourselves, to make ourselves seem more tough, impassive, detached. But once these layers are peeled back, people are incredibly loving, and we often do see that with catastrophes. The world itself is cleansing, and we are seeing people responding to one another with a deeper sense of humanity. That is why these events are happening. It's to evoke love and compassion in each of us to realise how important people are. People we've never met, we will be connecting with in order to help someone else. So we're in very interesting times and it's not necessarily as reported by the media. There's far, far more going on. So what I'll do is I'll firstly have a little meditation for a few minutes with you. If you can join me with this and let's send some very peaceful, loving energy into the world. This is very important electromagnetically. We send out the thoughts. All thoughts connect. This is how we create. We are all powerful and we're all equal. Once I do that, I'm going to read to you from a very interesting source <laughs> who has had enormous impact on the way I see the world. So let's first close our eyes and breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, just through the nose, release tension, breathe in love, breathe out animosity, breathe in compassion, breathe out deception. Breathe in truth. Breathe out lies. Breathe in unity. Breathe out unity. We're just going to focus on some trouble spots in the world. Afghanistan, sending light and love to there, to the people, to the nature. Iraq, Syria, we visualize it as an intense light being sent to these people and love, light of understanding and peace. Israel and Palestine, I send love and light to them. Egypt, Sudan, New Zealand, Nepal, Miami, Caribbean, Puerto Rico. Virgin Islands, Indonesia, China, the 
United States government. North Korean government, the people, the military, South Korea. Russia. See the earth as one ball, one energy, one life. The planet is shifting. This is the time of great awakening right now. This is the time of learning great peace. This is the time. <laughs> you either learn or you don't. <laughs> I am still learning. So I'm going to read you some really fascinating information which caught my attention back in 1998 actually I found this book in a bookshop and it was when I had no money which is <laughs> pretty normal in my life <laughs> but I really had no money at the time and it turned out I did discover I had some and I went to a bookshop in Manly in Sydney and I found this book book two now, when I first looked at it, it was a dialogue, and I went, oh, I'm not really into dialogues. I didn't, I didn't really want to read a dialogue. But we're talking a dialogue between Neil Donald Walsh and God. So this was a conversation with God, in fact. I thought, how can you have a conversation with God? I don't know about that. But when I read through it, things grabbed me. And I went, oh, I might just take this book. And I did. I put it under my bed for three months, didn't look at it. And then one night I suddenly felt to look at it, started reading it, kept reading it, got very excited. I started to cry because I recognised the wisdom in the book. I resonated with it. Now, this one's book two and it's, it's got a lot of advice and ideas about how to create enlightened governance on the planet. I myself am an economist and market analyst by training and experience. And what I haven't seen a great deal of is enlightened leadership. I see textbook paradigms playing out through MBA programs. I've experienced leadership by walking around. I've had managers do this who were teachers of management but didn't know how to lead and didn't understand the nature of principled leadership. And, of course, on the planet right now, many people are thinking this is not a particularly uh, principled world we're in. And certainly our disconnection from who we really are is very evident as we are tending to make decisions based on personal interests, things that profit ourselves rather than a collective um, awareness of how we impact others. Notions such as democracy are now more lip service. We're seeing increased power of multinational companies who are you know, generating the equivalent of GDP of small countries in terms of their revenue. We're seeing a lot of lies and deception through political circles too. And increasingly the pub public are feeling marginalized and powerless. And it's the powerlessness that's really the issue in relationship to peace. All conflict is coming from a base of powerlessness. So I'm going to read you this conversation between Neil and, and God or Source or Intelligent, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really have a name. We just tend to label things we don't understand. So I'll start it. This is coming, and I'll just say Source, Neil, like that. Source. It is time for the world to stop kidding itself, to wake up, to realise that the only problem of humanity is lack of love. 
Love breeds tolerance. Tolerance breeds peace. Intolerance produces war and looks indifferently upon intolerable conditions. Love cannot be indifferent. It does not know how. The fastest way to get to a place of love and concern for all humankind is to see all humankind as your family. The fastest way to see all humankind as your family is to stop separating yourself. Each of the nation states now making up your world must unite. That's definitely the message of unity. Neil says, we do have the United Nations source, which has been powerless and impotent in order for the body, for that body to work. It would have to be completely restructured, not impossible, but perhaps difficult and cumbersome. Neil, okay, what do you propose? Source, I don't have a proposal. I merely offer observations. In this dialogue, you tell me what your new choices are. And I offer observations on ways to manifest that. What is it you now choose with regard to the current relationship between people and nations on your planet? Neil, I'll use your words. If I had my way, I would choose for us to get to a place of love and concern for all humankind. Source, given that choice, I observe that what would work would be the formation of a new world political community with each nation state having an equal say in the world's affairs and an equal proportionate share of the world's resources. Neil, it'll never work. The haves will never surrender their sovereignty, wealth and resources to the have-nots and argumentatively, why should they? Source. because it's in their best interest. Neil, they don't see that, and I'm sure you don't. I'm sure, sorry, and I'm not sure I do, <laughs> he says. Source, if you could add billions of dollars a year to your national economy, dollars which could be spent to feed the hungry, clothe the needy, house the poor, bring security to the elderly, provide better health, and produce a dignified standard of living for all, would that be in your nation's best interest? Neil, well, in America, there are those who would argue that it would help the poor at the expense of the rich and of the middle income taxpayer. Meanwhile, the country continues to go to hell. Crime ravages the nation. Inflation robs the people of their savings. Unemployment skyrockets. The government grows bigger and fatter. And in school, they're handing out condoms. Source, you sound like a radio talk show. <laughs> of course, Neil used to be uh, um, a journalist. He was on radio. <laughs> That's why he's saying that. Well, it's saying that. It's not a he. Neil says, well, these are the concerns of many Americans. Source, then they are short-sighted. Do you not see that if billions of dollars a year, that's millions a month, hundreds and thousands hundreds and hundreds of thousands a week, unheard of amounts each day, could be sunk back into your system, that if you could use these monies to feed your hungry, clothe your needy, house your poor, bring security to the elderly, and provide health care and dignity to all, the causes of crime would be lost forever. Do you not see that new jobs would mushroom as dollars were pumped back into your economy? That your own government would even be reduced because it would have less to do. Neil, I suppose some of that could happen. I can't imagine government ever getting smaller. But just where are these millions and billions going to come from? Taxes imposed by your new world government? More taking from those who work to get it? To give to those who won't stand up on their own two feet and go after it? Source. Is that how you frame it? Neil goes, no, but it is how a great many people see it. And I wanted to fairly state their view. Source. 
Well, I'd like to talk about that later. Right now, I don't want to get off track, but I want to come back to that later. Neil, great. Source, but you've asked where these new dollars would come from. Well, they would not have to come from any new taxes imposed by the New World community, and in brackets, although members of the community, individual citizens would want, under an enlightened governance, to send 10% of their income to provide for society's needs as a whole. Nor would they come from new taxes imposed by any local government. In fact, some local governments would surely be able to reduce taxes. All of this, all of these benefits would result from the simple restructuring of your worldview, simpler reordering of your world political configuration. Neil says, how? The money you save from building defence systems and attack weapons. Neil, oh, I get it. You want us to close down the military. Source, not just you, everybody in the world. But not close down your military, simply reduce it drastically. Internal order would be your only need. You could strengthen local police, something you say you want to do, but cry each time at budget time, each year at budget time, that you cannot do it. At the same time, dramatically reducing your spending on weapons of war and preparations for war, that is, offensive and defensive weapons of mass destruction. Neil, first I think your figures exaggerate how much could be saved by doing that. Second, I don't think you'll ever convince people they should give up their ability to defend themselves. Source. Now, this book was released in 1994, so the numbers are out of date, but I'll just read out what's been said here. Let's look at the numbers. Presently, it's March 25, 1994, as we write this. The world's governments spend about a trillion dollars a year for military purposes. They still do, so that's relevant. That's a million dollars a minute worldwide. The nations that are spending the most could redirect the most to the other priorities mentioned. So larger, richer nations would see it's in their best interest to do so, if they thought it was possible. But larger, richer nations cannot imagine going defenceless, for they fear aggression and attack from the nations which envy them and want what they have. There are two ways to eliminate this threat. One, share enough of the world's total wealth and resources with all of the world's people so that no one, hang on, I'll just skip the page, so that no one will want and need what someone else has. And everyone may live in dignity and remove themselves from fear. Interesting. So this is about sharing. Two, create a system for the resolution of differences that eliminates the need for war and even the possibility of it. That's certainly my area, conflict resolution. So a system for resolution of differences. We're not talking about peace treaties here or negotiated settlements. The words that are being used here is a system for the resolution of differences. Now, Neil says the people of the world would probably never do this. Source says they already have. Neil goes, they have. Yes, there is a great experiment now going on in your world in just this sort of political order. That experiment is called the United States of America. Neil says, which you said has, was failing miserably. <laughs> Source, it is. It has very far to go before it could be called a success. As I promised earlier, I'll talk about this and the attitudes which are now preventing it later. Still, it is the best experiment going. It is, as Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst system, he announced, except all others. <laughs> Your nation was the first to take a loose confederation of individual states and successfully unite them into a cohesive group, each submitting to the one central authority. 
At the time, none of the states wanted to do this and each resisted mightily, fearing the loss of its individual greatness and claiming that such a union would not serve its best interests. It may be instructive to understand just what was going on with these individual states at the time. While, you had, while they had joined together in a loose confederation, there was no real US government and hence no power to enforce the Articles of Confederation to which the states had agreed. States were conducting their own foreign affairs, several reaching private agreements on trade and other matters with France, Spain and England and other countries. States traded with each other as well. And although the Articles of Confederation forbade it, some states added tariffs to the goods shipped in from other states, just as they did for goods from across the ocean. Merchants had no choice but to pay at the harbour if they wanted to buy or sell their goods, there being no central authority, although there was a written agreement to prohibit such taxing. The individual states also fought wars with each other. Each state, state considered its militia a standing army. Nine states had their own navies, and don't tread on me, would have been what they're saying, could have been the official motto of every state in the Confederation. Over half of the states were even printing their own money, although the Confederation had agreed that doing so would be illegal. In short, your original states, though joined together under the Articles of Confederation, were actually exactly an independent nations, were acting exactly as independent nations do today. Although they could see that the agreements of their confederation, such as the granting to Congress the sole authority to coin money, were not working, they staunchly resisted creating and submitting to a central authority that could enforce these agreements and put some teeth into them. Yet in time, a few progressive leaders began to prevail. They convinced the rank and file that there was more to be gained by creating such a new federation than there would be to lose. Merchants would save money and increase profits because individual states could no longer tax each other's goods. Governments would save money and have more to put into programs and services that truly helped people because resources would not have been used to protect individual states from each other. The people would have greater security and safety and greater prosperity too by cooperating with rather than fighting with each other. Far from losing their greatness, each state could become greater still. And that, of course, is exactly what happened. The same could have been made to happen with the 160 nation states of the world today. I think it's about 195 now. If they were to join together in a united federation, it could mean an end to war. So the model of the United States has been put here as the importance of cooperation rather than fighting with each other. The same argument is being put to the world today with, a, with its 195 nation states, cooperating rather than fighting each other. So Neil goes, so how so? There would still be disagreements. Source, so long as humans remain attached to outer things, that is true. There is a way to truly eliminate war and all experience of unrest and lack of peace, but that is a spiritual solution. We are here exploring a geopolitical one. Actually, the trick is to combine the two. Spiritual truth must be lived in practical life to change everyday experience. Until this change occurs, there would still be disagreements. You are right. Yet there need not be wars. There need not be killing. Are there wars between California and our Oregon over water rights? between Maryland and Virginia over fishing, between Wisconsin and Illinois, Ohio and Massachusetts? Neil says no. And why not? Have not various disputes and differences arisen between them? Neil says through the years, I suppose so. Source, you can bet on it, but these individual states have voluntarily agreed 
It was a simple voluntary agreement to abide by certain laws and abide by certain compromises on matters common to them, while retaining the right to pass separate statutes on matters relating to each individually. And when disputes between states do arise due to different, differing interpretations of the federal law or someone simply breaking that law, the matter is taken to a court, which has been granted the authority, in brackets, that is given the authority by the states to resolve the dispute. And if the current body of law does not provide a precedent or a means by which the matter can be brought through the courts to a satisfactory resolution, the states and the people in them send their representatives to a central government to try to create agreement on new laws that will produce a satisfactory circumstance, or at the very least, a reasonable compromise. This is how your federation works, a system of laws, a system of courts empowered by you to interpret those laws and a justice system backed up by armed might, if needed, to enforce the decisions of those courts. Although no one would, no one could argue that the system doesn't need improving. This political concoction has worked for more than 200 years. There is no reason to doubt that the same recipe will work between nation states as well. Neil says, if this is so simple, why hasn't it been tried? Source. It has. Your League of Nations was an early attempt. The United Nations is the latest. Yet one failed and the other has been only minimally effective because, like the 13 states of America's original confederation, the member nation states, and in brackets, particularly the most powerful, close bracket, are afraid they have more to lose than to gain from the reconfiguration. That is because the people of power are more concerned with holding on to their power than with improving the quality of life for all people. The haves know that such a world federation would inevitably produce more for the have-nots. But the haves believe this would come at their expense and they're giving up nothing. Neil says, isn't their, fearful, isn't their fear justified and is wanting to hold on to what you have so long struggled for unreasonable? Source. First, it is not necessarily true that to give more to those who now hunger and thirst and live without shelter, others must give up their abundance. As I've pointed out to you, all you would have to do is take the one trillion a year spent annually worldwide for military purposes and shift that to humanitarian purposes. And you will have solved the problem without spending an additional penny or shifting any of the wealth from where it now resides to where it does not. We should contemplate that. One trillion dollars per year shifted from the military to humanitarian. So no one's giving up anything, although the military will see that. But let's go on. Sources still continuing. In brackets, of course, it could be argued that those international conglomerates whose profits come from war and tools for war would be losers, as would their employees and all those whose abundance is derived from the world's conflict consciousness. But perhaps your source of abundance is misplaced. If one has to depend on the world living in strife in order for one to survive, Perhaps this dependence explains why your world resists any attempt to create a structure for lasting peace. Close brackets. Interesting, isn't it? So those who believe they're losing are quite willing to enable a world to continue in strife by supplying those weapons. And they become the very inhibitor to peace on the planet. As for the second part of your question, wanting to hold on to what you have struggled so long to acquire as an individual or, an, or as a nation is not unreasonable if you come from an outside world consciousness. Neil says a what? Source. 
If you derive your, your life's greatest happiness from experiences obtainable only in the outside world, the physical world outside of yourself, you will never want to give up an ounce of what, of all that you've piled up as a person and as a nation to make you happy. And as long as those who have not see their unhappiness tied to the lack of material things, they too will get caught in the trap. They will constantly want what you have got and you will constantly refuse to share it. That is why I have, I have said earlier that there is a way to truly eliminate war and all experience of unrest and lack of peace. But this is a spiritual problem. Ultimately, every geopolitical problem, just as every personal problem, breaks down to a spiritual problem. All of life is spiritual and therefore all of life's problems are spiritually based and spiritually solved. Wars are created on your planet because somebody has something that somebody else wants. This is what causes someone to do something that somebody else does not want them to do. All conflict arises from misplaced desire. just worth pausing so we're fighting over things I want that you've got it I want it it's very childish isn't it but it's a misplaced desire we feel we have to have it I'll, I'll continue so source says the only peace in all the world that is sustaining is internal peace let each person find peace within when you find peace within you also find that you cannot, you can do without. I'll just read that again. The only peace in all the world that is sustaining is internal peace. Let each person find peace within. When you find peace within, you also find that you can do without. This simply means that you no longer need the things of your outside world. Not needing is a great freedom. It frees you first from fear, fear that there is something you won't have, fear that there is something you have that you will lose, and fear that without a certain thing you won't be happy. Secondly, not needing frees you from anger. Anger is fear announced. When you have nothing to fear, you have nothing over which to be angry. You are not angry when you don't get what you want because your wanting it was simply a preference, not a necessity. You therefore have no fear associated with the possibility of not getting it, hence no anger. You are not angry when you see others doing what you don't want them to do because you don't need them to do or not to do or not do any particular thing, hence no anger. Isn't that interesting? I'll continue. So Source is saying you are not angry when someone is unkind because you have no need for them to be kind. You have no anger when someone is unloving because you have no need for them to love you. You have no anger when someone is cruel or hurtful or seeks to damage you, for you have no need for them to behave any other way, and you are clear that you cannot be damaged. You do not even have anger should someone seek to take your life because you do not fear death. When fear is taken from you, all else can be taken from you and you will not be angry. You know inwardly, intuitively, that everything you've created can be created again, or more importantly, that it doesn't matter. When you find inner peace, neither the presence nor the absence of any person, place or thing, condition, circumstance or situation can be the creator of your state of mind or the cause of your experience of being. 
This does not mean that you reject all things of the body, far from it. You experience being fully in your body and the delights of that as you never have before. Yet your involvement with things of the body will be voluntary, not mandatory. You will experience bodily sensations because you choose to, not because you're, you're required to in order to feel happy or to justify sadness. This one simple change, seeking and finding peace within, could, were it undertaken by everyone, end all wars, eliminate conflict, prevent injustice, and bring the world to everlasting peace. There is no other formula necessary or possible. World peace is a personal thing. What is needed is not a change of circumstance, but a change of consciousness. Neil goes on to say, so how can we find inner peace when we're hungry, be at a place of serenity when we thirst, remain calm when we are wet and cold and without shelter, or avoid anger when our loved ones are dying without cause? You speak so poetically, but is poetry practical? Does it have anything to say to the mother in Ethiopia who watches her emaciated child die for lack of one slice of bread? The man in Central America who feels a bullet rip through his body because he tried to stop an army from taking over his village. And what does your poetry say to the woman in Brooklyn raped eight times by a gang or the family of six in Ireland blown up by a terrorist bomb planted in a church on a Sunday morning? Source says, I can feel this actually. This is difficult to hear. But I tell you this, there is perfection everywhere in everything. Strive to see the perfection. This is the change of consciousness of which I speak. Need nothing. Desire everything. Choose what shows up. Feel your feelings. Cry your cries. Laugh your laughs. Honour your truth. Yet when all the emotion is done, be still and know that I am God. In other words, in the midst of the great tragedy, of the greatest tragedy, see the glory of the process, even as you die with a bullet through your chest, even as you are being gang raped. Now this sounds like such an impossible thing to do, yet when you move to God consciousness, you can do it. You don't have to do it, of course, it depends on how you wish to experience the moment. In a moment of great tragedy, the challenge always is to quiet the mind and move deep within the soul. You automatically do this when you have no control over it. Have you ever talked with a person who accidentally ran a car off a bridge or found himself facing a gun or nearly drowned? Often they will tell you that time slowed way down, that they were overcome by a curious calm that there was no fear at all. Fear not, for I am with you. That is what poetry has to say to the person facing tragedy. I'm feeling tears as I'm reading this. In your darkest hour, I will be your light. In your blackest moment, I will be your consolation. In your most difficult and trying time, I will be your strength. Therefore have faith, for I am your shepherd. You shall not want. I will cause you to lie down in green pastures. I will lead you beside still waters. I will restore your soul and lead you in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Wow. It, go, it goes on, and this, is, this sounds to me very Christian, but let's just go with it. And yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil, for I am with you. My rod and my staff will comfort you. 
I am preparing a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I shall anoint your head with oil. Your cup will run over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in my house and in my heart forever. Very interesting. I found out that that was um, Psalm 23. I'm not a Christian myself, but my my mum is. Um, she became a Christian later in life, but she was a Christian as a child as well. But I've also had a look into Buddhism and many other things, and my own poetry is my own religion probably. <laughs> But everybody's inspired, you see, we're the one family. So we're the family. The oneness is all about all of us coming together and does not this higher intelligence inspire everybody? Neil's not a Christian who's had this conversation with Source. Although he's, he, I think maybe in his earlier life he, he was a Catholic, I think. I'm not sure, actually. You'd have to check him out on the net because he does know a lot about it. Anyway, he goes on to say, that's wonderful. What you said there is just wonderful. I wish the world could get that. I wish the world could understand, could believe. Source says, this book will help that. You are helping that. So you are playing a role. You are doing your part in raising the collective consciousness. That is what all must do. So that's, that's what they call CWG, book one. Just wondering whether I might just say something else. I think the best thing for me to end on is really about love because for me love is my religion, <laughs> which is what led me to conversations with God and what's led me to study economics and what's led me to become a peace clown, travel the world and dedicate my life to peace. It's all come from love. So I'll finish this with love. This is actually... Another CWG book they call Conversations with God. This is book three, and this is the bit on love. Love is that which is unlimited. There is no beginning and no end to it, no before and no after. Love always was, always is, and always will be. So love is also always. It's the always reality. Now we get back to another word we used before, freedom. For if love is unlimited and always, then love is free. Love is that which is perfectly free. Now in the human reality, you will find that you always seek to love and to be loved. You will find that you will always yearn for that love to be unlimited. And you will find that you will always wish you could be free to express it. You will seek freedom, unlimitedness and eterna eternality. That's eternal, eternality. In every experience of love, you may not always get it, but that is what you will seek. You will seek this because this is what love is. And at some deep place, you know that because you are love. And through the expression of love, you are seeking to know and to experience who and what you really are. You are life expressing life, love expressing love, God expressing God. All these words are therefore synonymous. Think of them as the same thing. God, life, love, unlimited, eternal and free. It's all the same thing. Anything which is not one of these things is not any of these things. You are all of those things and you will seek to experience yourself as all of these things sooner or later. So I'll read that again. So you are God, life, love, unlimited, eternal and free. And being all this is the peace that passeth all understanding. And with that, on this International Day of Peace, 
May this video be sent out like a ripple on a concentric wave. May those who come to this video be truly in alignment with a desire for peace in this world. May the words in this video create the change we wish to see in the world. Even if you do not have a belief in a higher power, that's okay. Just look into what's being said here as propositions for creating a better world such as the Confederation, the United Nations becoming more effective in terms of its cooperation, seeing its individual self-interest as the collective interest, transferring the $1 trillion per year into helping to feed the poor, house them, create social programs that assist with health care and well-being and the welfare of humanity. So we're moving the monies from violence to humanitarian. And as was was said, you know, strengthening internal, you can strengthen internal policing, again through this transfer of money, which doesn't mean any single person has less in respect of their wealth. It's just a redistribution from one area to another. It's, only, it, it's literally, um, I've read it before, as 10% of all military spending can alleviate all the problems with water and refugees and sickness and health and poverty, unemployment. All these things can be changed for the better. And there goes your crime disappears off the face of the earth. There goes war, disappears off the face of the earth. So it's not a political solution we're seeking here. It's a spiritual solution. And in my worldview, it is to come into full alignment with love. To no longer be needy for the various things. To go and fight and argue and have conflict because you want this. Or the world should be turning up in your image rather than it just turns up as it does. For those who live in harmony with the way of it, understands there is a bigger picture and that we are on some level creating the life and times we're moving through right now. This is not an ending at this time in the world, even though some call it the end times. It's actually the ushering in of a new beginning. Depends on where you choose to identify yourself. I see myself as more connected to that higher consciousness. Therefore, if I recalibrate myself back into harmony, if I resolve all my conflicts, if I see my world as a family, then I am an example of peace. That's how I see it. And so are you. So I'll finish now. I truly send you deep peace, deep love, deep truth, reconciliation and empowerment to be the change you wish to see in the world. Stop waiting for things to happen. Be the change. You are what the world is waiting for. But do it with love and from a spirit of inner peace. Happy International Day of Peace. Bye.